Hello and welcome to another Sunday morning. We're excited to be here. Uh, we've been doing this for several weeks now. And not that we've become pros at it or anything, but I'm feeling more comfortable. How about you? Yeah, 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 it's been good. It's been good. Yeah, and I've been watching some of the tape and getting some feedback from some of the folks. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you for, for giving us this opportunity. There's nothing like teaching God's Word to learn God's Word. Yeah. And so I want to encourage you guys out there. Our lesson is, is about that. It's about getting out there and doing some things to make a difference. And you know, when you go out there and do things to make a difference, the one that it makes the biggest difference is in you. Amen? And supporting one another. Right. right. The, our lesson today is God gives the church spiritual gifts to accomplish His work. And so our question of the day is, when has been when has being a part of a group help you accomplish something big? Hector, you gotta be ready for my question. So you, you gotta be ready. So give me I'm, your answer. I'm good, but I'm good. All I, right. I want to talk about where I work at. Okay. Right? Because where we work at, we work in a warehouse and we receive cases, right? And the average cases that we receive per day is probably anywhere from 60,000 to 70,000 cases that we receive in. That's a lot of cases. You know, we the trucks unload them, we unload them. You know, we tag them, we shoot them up in the overflow with a forklift, then the night shift comes and then they ship out. But we, we do receiving during the day. I, and I remember one time last year, we had over 100,000 cases coming. Whoa, that's a lot of cases. And so we're used to 60 or 70 average, and we had an influx of cases coming in, over 100,000, and we had to come together as a group, right? And everybody played a different role, a vital role, right? And we actually finished not just on time, but early. We finished like one o'clock, 12 o'clock at noon. You know, we started at five in the morning. We were done by 12, 12.30, 1 o'clock. And that's like, that's like early. That's only like wow. seven, seven, eight hours at the most, right? And so we usually have to about two or three before the night shift comes in at four. But man, we just knocked it out. Like 100,000, man, we just, we felt like yeah. more than, we felt yeah, like more than conquerors. Yeah, <laughs> we felt like more than conquerors, right? But, but no, it was, it was a beautiful thing because well, we forecasted the hundred thousand. Well, what are we going to do? We got so and so off, and you know, what, you know, what's going to happen? A little bit of panic at the beginning. Yeah, day. and before, before right. the day started, and then when the day started, we just all came together as a group, you know, and we uh, came together and we we knocked it out of the park, you know, and it was a beautiful thing to see something we accomplished something big, as the question says, right? Yeah, and you know, accomplishing something big with teamwork is what's really important. I know in my life, I, I have, you know, I'm in a technology company, and I'm not a technologist but I put all the right pieces together. And when we build software, it's really cool. You have your developers, you have your database people, you have your architects, you have the people to keep the computers running. My son, John, is a, is a real high-end programmer guy, right, for a special package. And his computer broke the other day, and he told my other son, Jacob, to help him. And my wife, Frida, says, how come John gets paid a lot of money to do all this? How come he can't fix his own computer? <laughs> and I said, well, he said, that's not his skill set. His skill is, programming on a good computer, yeah. not working on that computer. Jacob was better at working on the computer, so he fixed it for his brother to get the work done. So everybody has their role. My other one was in the fire department. We had, you know, I was on a motor company, so we actually went in there and fought fire. We had things that we had to do. A truck company would come in, they didn't have water or anything, but they would come and turn off the lights, they would uh, stop the electricity, they would stop all the gas flow. They do things like that. They're like really good janitors. And I say that joking because firemen <laughs> always fight between the motorman and the truck man. But everybody has their role. And it's just like that in our church. Everyone has their role. And, and Paul, on this lesson, talks about that, yeah. that everybody has their role. You know, last week we talked a little bit about power of prayer and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed our last week's lesson. And I've been calling a brother of mine, this Pastor Ballesteros, who runs New Hope Church uh, over there off of Highway 16. And he got uh, the coronavirus. And the first time I talked to him, they just sent him home from the hospital. He went there telling him he was sick and he came back home. And he sounded really bad, but he said he thought he was doing better. I called him two or three days later. He was now in the hospital and he was in really bad shape. And I share that because I really want you to pray for him. And I know God's got great things. We talked on the phone for a long time. I felt guilty talking to him because he was labor even talking, Hector. And I was just, it was, it was sad. But let's keep him in prayer. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, remember Sergio? You yeah, Sergio. For Sergio. He's out of the hospital, praise yeah, God. That's good. And uh, he has he had a clean bill of health, and he's doing much better. 
Uh, I told my friend that asked me to pray for his brother. Is, is, you know, my friend was super happy that that we prayed for him. You know, especially before right before the lesson. So I wanted to ask if you can. You know, I know you asked for for a prayer for him for uh, the the pastor. And uh, but I have another friend, uh, Anthony. Uh, I didn't know you had that many friends. I thought I was like, <laughs> outside of there, outside of church, outside of this bubble. Yeah, okay. I have other friends. Okay. And uh, but no, I pray for Anthony. You know, he's he's not feeling too good. I I called him uh, the other day. Um, Saturday, I called him on Saturday, and uh, we were talking to him, and he was telling me what's going on, and I had my wife and my two kids in the truck, and so I said, you know what, man, uh, I'm gonna pray for you, and he's like, oh, okay, I appreciate it, brother. I'm like, no, no, we're gonna pray right now, and so while we were driving in the truck, we prayed, and the cool part is my family, they all closed their eyes, you know, and, and after I finished praying, they all said, amen. And I didn't tell them, okay, we're going to pray, family, stop playing on your games. I didn't tell them that. Just I just prayed. Yeah. They usually, they usually they don't listen to my conversations, but they actually, when Amen. I said, well, let's pray right now, then they just stopped. You know, Amen. And they prayed, they prayed with us. And, That's good. So just keep him in prayer. Also. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, Father. And I just pray that this lesson just embeds in our hearts and our minds so we can follow your will, Father. I thank you for answered prayers for that we played last week for Sergio, Father. And right now, I just want to lift up my brother, Pastor Ballesteros, that you just be with him, God, and give him peace and, and understanding. I pray for his wife and those around him that you just bless them in a real and powerful way, Father. And I just, I don't know why he's going through this, Father, but I know there's a purpose and there's a reason because you hold all things and you allow all things, Father, for your honor and your glory. And I just pray for that, Father. I pray for Hector's friend, Anthony. I just, we just lift him up. Father, in prayer, and I thank you for Hector bringing this to our attention so that we can lift him in prayer, Father, and, and just begin to heal his body and heal his mind and help him to have the understanding that, Father, that you are the, the one that does all the healing, Father, and that he can give you all glory and all honor. God, I just ask you and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, lo I, I, I like our lesson today, Hector, because it's really about being active in the church and moving and being quick with things. The different roles. Of the it. different roles. And I love the different roles. You know, I, a lot of people know I've been coaching Pop Warner football for 27 years. No, it's about 30 years. And I've had, I've, in fact, I was cleaning out some boxes and I found some old flags, city champs and region state champs. And so, you know, been all the way even to Florida. So I, I love coaching. And every kid, when I run them, oh, that's a lineman. You know, really strong in line. The real fast one is running back. Smarter kid, hey, that might be quarterback. Hey, this one. And you start identifying, you put your pieces all together, and they're all very important to win games. And I think of things like that. I think of the fire department. Think of your work. Putting 100,000 cases, Hector, you can't do that. Everybody says, okay, let's charge. You just can't do that, right? You got to be organized. Everybody got to know what their role is and how to do those things and then getting it done. But I think the biggest thing, you can't do any of those things you mentioned if you're selfish. Oh, if yeah. you're just totally individualistic and you're totally just looking for yourself and and like, you know, an employee could have said, well, I made my money, I'm done. No, you know, everybody just had to pitch in and help one another. Same thing in football, right? You could right. Say, I got my yards. No, he didn't say no. that. You know, they have to block for each other. They, they got to block, they got to throw, they got to yeah. hit. All that takes teamwork. And so our, our setting here today, did you want to go in the... Uh, yeah, I'll read it real quick. I okay. know we're going a little long. In the Message to the leaders. Read that part. It says, every Christian, when they come to faith, receive a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit. These gifts are, are to be used primarily for serving and building up others. First, those within the church, but also to reach the lost and bring them into church. When we use our gifts to teach scripture, pray in faith, encourage others, and many other things, we are building up the church as God intended. Amen. That's a beautiful uh, message to the leaders uh, to start our lesson. Amen. 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 I like that. Uh, and so our our, our our lesson here talks about Paul, and he's always talking about, uh, there was actually, the, the, our lesson says there was three different times that he spoke on referencing the body and the different body parts that serve, but we all serve the body, right? And Christ is the head, and then, and then we all have our function. So he's talking about that, and, he, and I love the way he does this to the Ephesian people. He's, he loved the Ephesian church, and he wanted them to work harmoniously and together to do God's will. And when we have that, and things are different, right? Things are just so much different. We can follow that. So let's get into our verses right now. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Get your Bibles. You can pause it right now. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And don't just listen to us. Get your Bible or get something to write with so that you can take notes. And these things are important. I mean, we're speaking these things. You'll forget it. But if you write it down and you look at it later on, it, it absorbs into your mind and your heart. We're preaching to you out of God's word. We're giving you godly lessons. Pay attention. Pause it. Get something to write with. I think the, the biggest thing is exactly what you said, John. We have to ask ourselves, how can I apply this to my life? Exactly. Whenever we read the word of God. Amen. Amen. And so it's Ephesians 4, 1 through 7. It says, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humanity and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope at your calling, the Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Okay, I love this. He said, calling you receive with all humility and gentleness. You know, what? here's the problem with today's people at church. And I was like this. I've been guilty of this too. They want to do their church like if they're buying a car, right? Well, let me go see the church. Let me test drive the church. <laughs> let me go see how the music is. The pastor's a little boring. Uh, music's not too good. Um, I don't like this. I don't like, it's all about me, <laughs> right? Do I like the pastor's voice? Do I like the singing? Ooh, I love the pastor. He's good, but they're singing his week. Let me go check a few more churches. Because <laughs> it's all about you. Let's stop that. God put you at this church, you're in this community, and you want to serve, then serve. Then forget about all that. Other stuff. When the preacher's preaching, he's preaching out of the Word of God. You know, I, I one of the best preachers that I've ever heard was uh, uh, Brother Garcia at, uh, at Ben Ayan. But Brother Garcia talked very slow, and he would talk really slow like this. <laughs> and I, and I do, I'm not disrespecting because I love, but he's one of the, he was so deep in God's Word. I loved it, but I heard so many people say, oh, I don't like going to that church because I, I, he doesn't talk fast enough for me. And I said, well, quit listening to his voice and how fast he talks and listen to what he's saying and apply it and look at God's scripture. The man was full of knowledge. You know, I praise God. We're blessed here. We have a good pastor. We have good music. We have good membership. Yet people still complain. Oh, the music. Oh, this. Oh, they don't help. Me. Oh, I don't get a hug. Quit crying about you, 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 you. And start thinking about how do I give to other people? God saved us, Hector, in a personal way. Mm. But he sent us out to live our personal relationship in a community. Yeah. And if we don't start doing that, then that's where we're gonna we're gonna mess up. The Bible teaches that believers share a great responsibility for one another. Yes. We share a responsibility for one another. And when we start to remember that and feel that, then we we can know how God can use us. To serve others. And when you do that and you have that mentality, that's kingdom of God. Yeah. We talked about that for a few weeks now. Yeah. And I just think that's so important. Yeah, and you know, Paul began in verse one and he's he's talking that we need to we need to live uh he was urging us to live worthy of the calling, right? Amen. And so the biggest thing about that is that how does that look like, right? That means that it's gonna be our our what's our responsibility towards others, right, John? And we cannot separate living a life worthy of the gospel from our connection with other believers. Right? We can't be individualistic <laughs> mentality. That's what, yeah, that's what the culture is right now. That's what the culture is right now. But our sinful nature, our sinful human nature, it says, is drawn to selfishness. Right? So it is necessary that we break from an individualistic mindset, as you just said, right? And think of others. And it said, instead, by the grace God supplies, we are to pursue unity. In other words, we're supposed to pursue the unity, right? We're supposed to do everything we can to, to strive for unity and with, with others and the church. Amen. So we're supposed to, and God wants a church that's going to be united. God wants his people to be united. Amen. He doesn't want them to be just, it's all out for me. And what, what, what can I get out of this? Right. He wants us it's for the betterment of the group. Amen? Amen. And so Paul didn't tell us to create unity. He told us to keep the unity, John. And so we see that. I mean, I want to hit that. That's really important. We're not to create unity. We're to keep unity. Yeah. The unity should just be a, a byproduct of our Christian lives walking together. When we're not united, it's because we're messed up. We're messed up. And it's all about me, me, me. 
Let's get united. Let's say, man, God, I want to serve you. This church is feeding over 60 something churches every Thursday out of this parking lot. We're feeding over 15 uh, nonprofit organizations through our parking lot. Sometimes up to two to five state agencies we feed out of this parking lot. It's not us doing it, it's not, uh, but God has blessed us with the opportunity and we have membership going out there and serving and serving and, serving, and people are being blessed. But it's God's people working together. And if you're and if you're just going to sit on the sidelines and not get it, then you are missing blessing on top of blessing. When you, I, I, I imagine, even myself, when we pass away, we're going to say, wow, God, I missed out on a huge filling life because I didn't serve the way I was supposed yeah. to serve. And and the food that we're giving away is good food. <laughs> I had a chance to taste the mashed potatoes last night at my son's house. And They're good. And Maria put cheese and, you know, and Ooh, she, man, and I put good. some ranch on there. You know, it was, they, were, they were delicious. And it was it was a bag in a bag in a, uh, what is it? It's the one in the bag, right? Yeah, right? yeah, it's, yeah. It's boiling bag or something like that, right? It's real easy to, to make. And then the french fries, we made french fries and stuff the other day. And, and the, the, the produce boxes, I gave one to my son. Or I gave him two last time. And so I was kind of discouraged. I was holding one back. And I left it in my truck, and uh, I just gave him the mashed potatoes, right, and the French fries. And I, and I said, before we left, I go, son, do you want the you want the produce box? Because you know I already had given them too, just a couple of days ago. And he says, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, we gave it to the neighbor. It, you know, my daughter-in-law was telling me that they gave it to the neighbor, and uh, the neighbor had a whole bunch of kids. She goes, I don't know if they were his kids or his grandkids or they they were visiting or whatever. He goes, but they almost ate that whole bag of apples. And I was blessed to hear that. Hey, man. And he was like, yeah, give me that box. And I, to me, I thought, Dad, you're giving me too much. You know, it's, but they're sharing. Yeah, they're sharing it with their neighbors. And that's that's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, you all, John always, when we do the food, he they say two families. He gives three families. He goes, give one to your neighbor. And that's what we're supposed to be doing with this food ministry. Amen. Amen. And so let's go back to that. It says, Paul didn't tell us to create unity. We are to keep the unity through the gospel. Jesus already brought unity by reconciling two opposing sides, the holy God and the sinful people. Amen. Amen. That's where the unity is at. And the two separated people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Amen. And it says we maintain this unity because God gives us unity and relationships. Amen. To experience true unity, we must be humble. Humility causes us to consider others, not just ourselves. We should show others the mercy and forgiveness Jesus has shown us, and it's all driven by love. Right. And then the other one was God gives us unity in beliefs. You know, this, over the spiritual spectrum, there's all kinds of beliefs. And you can get the Bible, and we can kind of interpret different things. In the Bible, those are all minor things. But the, the strong, solid things we stand firm on, we know that Christ died for us. We know that God loved us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us so that we could have eternal life. We know that He was He was killed mm. and that He was crucified, crucified, yeah. crucified. And He rose from the dead three days later to give us the gift of eternal life. We know that as a fact. Now, if you're going to fight about all the little things, that's okay. There's different beliefs. But the solid core things that, that are in the Bible, we believe those. So we have so much to be united about. Why are we fighting? Yeah, you know, we got everything else that. is just minor. But if you yes. can agree that Jesus is Lord, Amen. Yes, and then Jesus is the the way, the truth, and the life. Man, that's all you really need. Yeah, because you have all the small stuff that Amen. might make a little bit of problems, but the strong stuff unites. Us. Amen. And the question, the question is, why is it so difficult to to maintain unity? In the church, what a question! <laughs> and that's not a question for for young people. I mean, young people, you got that. But that's questions for the adults too. You know, why is it so difficult to maintain unity in the church? But you know, I think it goes with the you know we're we're making this video for for the teenagers, for the youth, right? But youth, you you can you can answer this question, right? Uh, you're in the youth group when we were meeting together. Did you get along with everybody? Were you was the youth group united, or did you just have your special people, and then they had their special people on this side, and over here they had another group of people? Were we really united? Only you can answer that, you know. And if you weren't, you know, what? Why is it so difficult to maintain that unity in the church? Not just with adults, but with teenagers, right? And so the first thing I came up with: selfishness, self-seeking, uh, not thinking of others, right? 
And I thought about there's no joy, right? You know, the acronym for joy is Jesus, others, and yourself. You know, but when it's all just self-centered, there's not going to be no, you can't maintain unity. Amen? Right. I, I think that when you have love, love conquers everything. If you have true love for God, true love for your fellow man, then even if you're that person that's causing the, the mess ups, you can have that conviction. You just got to be strong enough to step back and say, man, I'm messing up. I apologize. I'm sorry. I need to get running right on I got. We got to help the community. And when you got a church that's striving to help the community and striving to do those things of God, we need to encourage those things. You don't want to be that one person that gets in there and is a stumbling block for everybody, right? We always have those type of people, yeah. right? I know that, and I don't want to say this because I'm not going to say any names, but we had a guy in the fire department, and they called him Topper. And then I, when I first met him, why didn't we call him top all the time? No matter what story we told, he would top it. He goes, oh man, I got this big old shark. It was about that big. Oh, I got five that were like this big, you know, with my hands. You know, he always had a top story to top you. And he, but we all have that reputation, right? We want to be able to recognize, are we a stumbling block? Or are we helping the church move forward? So it's, it's two choices. It's not like, well, then I just won't go to church. Or I'll just sit there and shut up. Don't do that. God's got a purpose for you. Find your purpose, find the gift, which we're going to talk about here next. Find that gift and watch God begin to work in your life, but more importantly, working in the lives of others in the church. Amen. So let's, let's read, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. I'll read that, Hector. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Amen. And Amen. It's, it says, uh, when we are saved, God gives us spiritual gifts, right? To some, there, you know, and those gifts are meant to serve the church, John. And he says, there are a variety of gifts, but for some, he has gifted us in specific ways Right, and so so we can equip and we can lead the church for for God's ministry, Amen. And it says that the leaders God has given the church are the apostles, right? The, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Some of these leaders hold more authority than others, especially the apostles and prophets. The apostles included Paul, who wrote this, right, and and the twelve who walked closely with Jesus, his disciples. Uh, those Jesus personally called and sent out. These men led the early church and authored much of the New Testament, right? And said, though the writings, they're still building us up 2,000 years later. You know, well, the things they did 2,000 years ago is still relevant. Still applicable. To, yeah. To the, how can we apply God's word, right? And then it goes on to say that evangelists, pastors, and teachers also build up the body of Christ through their gifts. So you want to read my part? To the <laughs> they proclaim the word of God to us and explain what it means to live for Christ. Right. And I like this because they teach us to obey God's word. So we got to be, this is telling you young people and telling the adults that you have your pastors, you have your teachers, you have your leaders. And in this church, to be Pastor Byron, and then you, and then uh, we have Thomas, yeah. who's associate pastor. We Spanish have pastor. A Spanish pastor, David Rios. We have the different leaders in the church. You got teachers. They're not anything closer to God, but they're put in those positions of leadership so that we can learn. So what, what Paul is telling the Ephesians here, you listen to these people in leadership, you take what they have, and you apply it to your life, and you study God's Word, and you listen to them, because they're put in this position to teach us. And when we do that, we can see how God can be... We've got to break down ourselves, because a lot of times, man, if you don't see it on the Internet, or if your friends aren't saying it, then it's not cool, and this, and that. Paul said, forget about that. This is where it's at. Because if you want to think about this, we're not of this world. Yeah. We're set apart. We're holy. We're different. And right here, these people that are in charge in, in, these, in, the, in this leadership role are here to teach us so that we can grow and be the effective Christians that God wants us to. So we can have that fullness of Christ mm -hmm. in our life. Amen. And so um, there's four specific reasons. Yes, there's four specific reasons that, that they said in this scripture based on this passage. The first one was to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So equip us. So it, when it, If they're here to equip us and you're just sitting in a chair every Sunday doing nothing, you're not being equipped. But if you're sitting in the chair listening and learning 
so that you can be a teacher, so that you can minister, so you can work in the kitchen, so you can help with the sound, so you can help clean up outside. I'm blessed when I see Brother Walters out here. Brother Walters out here cutting grass and doing everything early Saturday morning because he loves the Lord, right? So we should find our roles in that. The next one? It's, it's to build up the body of Christ, right? And I, I was just thinking about what you were just saying to equip the saints, right? We have some, we have, I think, 12, 13 deacons, right? And not all of them are teachers, amen? Now, some of them, like like Brother Don, he he drove the vans, right? He would pick up he would pick up members. He would pick up people from the school. He would drop them off on Wednesdays. You know, there that's different roles. You just talked about Walter. Walter doesn't teach, you know, here in the church, but he's cutting the grass. Different roles supporting one another in the church, amen. And they're all very important. Doesn't mean the teacher's more important. Every role is important in right. the church, as long as you're serving with love. Right. And another thing they were talking about is to lead the body to unity around the truth of Jesus. So, and it goes back to the leadership side, that's what they're trying to do is a unity and we learn about God through our Sunday school lessons. When Pastor Byron was speaking on a Sunday morning, and if you're not intently listening, writing notes, I hope your Bible open, or are you playing on your phone, doing texting, well, I'm in church, now you just put in a check mark, okay, I got insurance, okay, so I die, whatever. It's not what it's about. God is calling you to be there because he's got a word for you. Pastor Byron has that word that God has for you. The problem is, are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you grabbing it? Because the Bible says that when you do grab it and you do find it, it's more precious than gold. And how powerful that would be. If you really believe that it's more precious than gold, then you'd be looking for it. You yeah. would want it because it would make an effort in your life. Next one, Hector. And then the last point is to help the church look like Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that's really important. Does the church look like Jesus? You know, somewhere, some people will have difference of opinions, right? But at the end of the day, if the leadership is showing love, then yeah, the church does look like Jesus. So that's a matter of opinion, right? But from my point of view, I would say, yes, this church looks like Jesus. Amen? Because they're loving, they're forgiving, they're not judgmental. Amen? And so and when we're serving the community, amen, on Thursdays and any other day. Right? Right. But you know, the heart of the church is the people, right? That shows you what the true heart of the church is if you go. One thing I, I, I want to say that's important is that a lot of times what people look for in church, they want to come in and have that feel good, and they want the pastor to do everything. Yeah. You know, and and, and that's the way it is in a lot of churches. It, you know, I had a pastor call me that he got sick, and he says, man, I can't pick up food on Thursday. And he said, you know what, Brother John, the thing that bothers me is the most? And I said, what's that, brother? He goes, I don't have anybody that will pick up the food for mm -hmm. me. None of my members would be willing to go out there, or, or should I even bother? to go out there to pick up the food. If it wasn't me doing it, no one would do it. Yeah. And it, it was like a thing in him. He goes, I gotta fix that, man. I got I'm not doing a good job teaching people to love Jesus the way they should yeah. to do that. Man, that touched me, right? And I started thinking about that. We rely on our pastors a lot. You know, Pastor Byron has gone through some sickness, right? And I know his immune system's down and we gotta really be careful with him, especially with COVID-19, our pastor. But you know what? He has not slowed us down one bit. Use the church. Do this. Do that. I call him for like something. Said, "Hey, can we do? Quit bugging me. You can do it." Because he knows it's for the betterment of Christ and spreading the gospel. So, I, you know, I just think that's so so important that the church's heart is judged by the way that people are ministering. Yeah. And, and and right now we have a very active and, and going church. I know and, we're running short on time. Well, the last point right here, real quick, mm -hmm. says when we when we all join together in the work of ministry. The entire body grows in maturity and looks more like Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so that's where we're at to help the church look like Jesus. Amen. Amen. You I'm going to skip those two questions after okay. go into Ephesians. Do you want to read that? Four, we're in chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Go it ahead. says, There will no longer be little children tossed by, but by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Man, I love this right here. The church is the body with Jesus as the head. We've got to remember that. Paul explained this 
to the people in, in Corinthia, in Ephesus, and, and when he wrote the book of Romans, he talks about the body, right? And he says all these things to, to make up that we all have the different uh, jobs to do. Uh, in our church, those, those that, that, that are more service-minded, there's more that are that like teaching. You know, if it was up to me, I love teaching, right? I just love teaching. But I also know, and I really found, I'm not lying, these last few years, I've really come out loving to serve. Even to the point where Hector blessed me, he gave me some salmon. And I love that salmon, it's a big box and there's a lot of salmon in it. So I cut it up into individual bags, we made bags we put it away, and I liked it. One of my boys comes up to me and says, Dad, don't give all that away. <laughs> And I said, what are you talking about? Because you get excited because you see something like this and it's real good, and you want to give it to other people. And I said, be quiet, man. I got some. This is going to be for us. But yeah, I'm going to give this part to But it made me think, what kind of legacy am I leaving for my son? My dad gave, right? And even though we laughed about it now, he didn't say it in a nice way tonight. He was like, don't get rid of that salmon. Let's eat it all. And he already knew I was already going to give someone. But I haven't learned service as much as I have in these last few years. But it's contagious. And when you start doing these things and you start fulfilling your role, you watch how God blesses you. And Paul talks about here about us being like the body. There's all different parts of the body. And, um, and we all do different things. And I want to encourage you to embrace the role and the gifts that God has bestowed upon you and begin to use them for God's yeah. glory. Amen? Yeah, and just to sum it up real quick, I know you went to, through it, but, you know, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? And it says some believers are gifted to serve in leadership. Others demonstrate great acts of mercy, service, generosity, right? So you were talking about all that. You're talking about the human body. But I want to end it here at the last point. It says when we live pridefully according to our own ideas, we remain immature. Amen. Amen. And the church fails to function in a healthy way. Part of being a healthy body is being mature. Uh, I, I, just, I want to give a little shout out real quick. My daughter, she's starting up soccer and she's going to have soccer at 7.30 tomorrow and uh, 7.30 on Thursday. And so on Wednesdays we have a Zoom class, but it's from 7 to 7.40, right? And so she didn't want to miss that. So she says, Dad, I'm going to, when you take me to the practice, I'll be on the Zoom on my phone. While we get in there and I'll be late to practice 10 minutes so I can stay on there. And I said, okay, I didn't ask her to do that. She just wanted to do that. And then on Thursday, and I said, well, on Thursday, I told her, we'll go help John in the food giveaway after your practice. She says, no, dad, because if it starts at 730, it's not going to end till 830. We're not going to get to the church till nine. She was, I already told them, I'm not going to soccer practice. Wow. She goes, I want to come and serve the community. And I, I was proud of my daughter Genesis because that's a sign of maturity. The immature part would have been like, oops, I got soccer. Sorry, John. <laughs> I thought you would have taken that from you now. <laughs> no, but that's good. But that, that was a sign, of, of, that was sign of maturity because I didn't Amen. have to force her to do that. Amen. She just said, no, I'd rather serve and give out food to the community. Amen. So that was a blessing there. And so as we move on, right, it says, but when we unite under godly leaders according to the truth of God's word, Humbly serving others as an act of loving sacrifice, the church is united. And this makes a powerful difference in the lives of church members, as well as among those watching in the world. Amen. Amen. We're out of time, Hector, but I do want to leave you with the last question. How, listen to this question, how have you bought into a how can the church serve me mentality? I want you to examine your lives, young people and adults. Do you have anywhere in your heart how does the church serve me mentality? And let's flush that out and say, God, how can I serve you? Amen. Amen. Great lesson, Hector. Have fun with this one. God bless, really you guys. God bless you guys. And we'll see you next Sunday. Amen. Later.